Ladies and gentlemen, the exhibit halls are now open. Please stop by the AUSA membership booth, which is in South Hall Lobby, for benefits and discounts of two five year and four year lifetime community partnership opportunities. Thank you. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Kirst and his team as they present electric vertical takeoff and landing. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope everybody's awake this morning. You've had your first cup of coffee because we have a really exciting topic to talk about this morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Jim Kirsch. I'm the director of the Aviation and Missile Center. And we have with us today a very distinguished panel of senior scientific and technical experts from across our center to talk about electric uh, VTOL and really electrification in general. So if we can go up, all right, we're having some technical difficulties with the slide. So we'll just go ahead and get started anyway. So if you don't know what much about the Aviation and Missile Center, we are part of DEVCOM and part of the Army Futures Command. And so our primary role as a DEVCOM and Army Futures Command entity is the science and technology that goes into our next generation aviation and missile capabilities. Because we do that work and because we have the expertise in anything related to aviation and missile technologies, we also provide a significant amount of support to our acquisition teammates across Team Redstone, PU Aviation, PU Missiles in Space, the RICTO, uh, MDA, AMCOM, in providing them life cycle engineering support across the life cycle from the early S&T all the way through the engineering and, and final development to the production and fielding and sustaining those capabilities in the field. So it really is an entire life cycle support uh, to our aviation and missile enterprise across the Army and in some cases across DOD as other services also use those uh, same capabilities in many cases. All right, let's skip ahead uh, two slides and talk about what we're going to talk about today and why it's important. So many of you know the uh, country as a whole is really focusing in on electrification and alternative ways of powering um, everything that we do. So electrification is driven into some of the very foundational strategy documents that OSD and the Army has pu have published. And as we look at electrification, we're looking not just at electric VTOL, uh, as a one-stop uh, one or one-application solution, but really how does hybrid electrification impact our systems uh, from, uh, from across the, the spectrum? So really, at the present time, we don't have a formal requirement that says this is what electrification needs to do for our systems. We're really in the science and technology phase of understanding where are the good applications, what are the challenges, what are the advantages, what does this technology bring to the fight? As, as we look at transforming the Army. So if you, if you listen to General Rainey's speech yesterday and he talked about we're really looking at transforming the Army across three specific time frames. Transformation in contact, what can we do in the next 18 to 24 months? Probably not a whole lot that we're gonna do from an electric aircraft in the next 18 to 24 months, at least not from a man perspective. Then we have uh, deliberate transformation over the next, say, five to seven years. And that's really where we are going to be delivering the signature modernization capabilities, but also some providing some opportunities to start integrating and planning for electrification of those capabilities in the future. And then, of course, there's the concept-driven transformation, which is really out in the future, and that's where a lot of the S&T will be focused over the next few years. The opportunity right now to invest is really wide open. And what's really uh, nice for the Army and for the government at this point is there is so much commercial and investment capital going into this technology that we get a tremendous return on our investment. A little bit of government money goes a long way because it shows an interest from Army, from the DOD, and venture capital and investors are willing to then put money into those technologies as well. So we're not having to put in a ton of Army money. We're putting in a little bit of Army, Army money to learn some specific things, but that Army money might be 10 or 40 or even 50 times multiplied by investment capital that's really getting after some of the really hard challenges facing us from an electrification standpoint. 
So uh, where we're investing is really in partnership with Agility Prime, an Air Force program that's looking at electric VTOL. But as you'll hear today, uh, we'll talk about some of the challenges with vertical flight, and we'll also talk about some of the opportunities to where electrification can impact uh, those capabilities. So let's go to the next slide and we'll introduce our panel. So right next to me here is Dr. Mahendra Bhagwat. He is one of our Army Science and Technology Senior Scientists, and his specific area is in aerodynamics and rotorcraft design. Sitting next to him is uh, David Friedman, and David leads our uh, hybrid aircraft, hybrid electrification, science and technology activities. And then on the far right is uh, CW4 Brian McCormick. Chief McCormick, uh, one of his claims to fame, other than being one of our really super uh, experimental test pilots, is he is the second Army aviator uh, to pilot an all-electric aircraft, uh, and did that just uh, within the last month or so. So uh, welcome to the, to the uh, panel, gentlemen, and I will turn it over to Dr. Bodwap to, to talk about some things. Thank you, sir. All right, so Mahendra Bhagwat, I'm one of the scientists at the Aviation and Missile Center. My area is aeromechanics, and so I'm obliged to start the, the talk with a picture showing aeromechanics challenges. Just to set the ground, uh, you know, VTOL is hard, so why do we do it? Think about it. Uh, what aviation brings to the Army is enhanced <laughs> mobility, both in and out of the operating theater or uh, intra-theater. All that requires vertical lift, VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing capability. And rotors are the best for VTOL. Aerodynamically, they are the most uh, efficient in hover and vertical flight. But in forward flight, they are a mess. You can see in this picture here that you get every imaginable aerodynamic phenomena, every single rotor revolution. So that constant knocking, constant high unsteady loading, and a lot of moving parts make sustainment a big challenge. And maybe that's where putting a little E in front can help. So think about even a single main rotor helicopter. Uh, it will definitely benefit from reduced noise and vibration. Uh, the quadcopter has become ubiquitous. It's so easy to fly, it's almost a toy. Well, it is a toy. The distributed electric propulsion that uh, enables the quadcopter has also given rise to a whole suite of configurations with multiple rotors without the need for a complex and heavy drivetrain. But these configurations also have challenges, uh, not just uh, electric-related uh, challenges, but also aeromechanics challenges. So think about what this picture would look like with one of these configurations with, you know, half a dozen or a dozen rotors. I'm not being pessimistic, so challenges are also opportunities. And to really make use of these opportunities, what we need is a strategy. Uh, that's where David comes in. He's our uh, aviation electrification guru, and he's been working on defining and refining our strategy. But while he's been doing that, we have kept pace with the technology by working with our partners across government, industry, and academia. Go to the next chart, please. So we've been working with NASA on uh, developing our modeling tools and methods. NASA has really spearheaded the effort to get the industry to start adopting these cutting-edge tools early on in their design cycle to avoid late surprises. And these are not Army or DOD tools, these are public domain tools. Yet from this partnership, we get a lot of shared knowledge, lessons learned that can help, help us keep our tools sharp. We have been working with the Air Force uh, with their AFWORKS Agility Prime program, and through that, with a lot of industry partners. I'm going to highlight two here, uh, the pictures in the middle, Joby Aviation. Uh, you may be familiar with their uh, eVTOL that's been flying unmanned for like two or three years now. We worked with them on an acoustics flight test uh, on, and on a recent wind tunnel test. And we have been exercising our high fidelity modeling tools to study this configuration. Not just to understand what we are seeing in these tests, but also to validate our methods and then prove them. The pictures on the right is Beta Technologies. Uh, they have an interesting approach. They have been focusing 
on the E part of the challenges before the VTOL part. So they have a all electric conventional takeoff and landing aircraft that's been flying for also a couple of years now. And in the picture there, uh, Wes Ogden, one of our pilots, was the very first Army pilot to fly these uh, aircrafts. Uh, you later hear from Brian, who was the second pilot, uh, a bit of a pilot operator perspective on these electric vehicles. Next slide, please. A quick shout out to our uh, university partners. We have been working with the universities uh, on various areas related to electrification for five, six, seven years now. Everything starting from batteries, motors, transmission, hybrid electric power trains, even some non-propulsion application of some of these electric technologies. Uh, remember, this is uh, basic research, so this is not meant to develop a technology and take it to, a, to the finish line. This is not meant to develop an airplane, but to develop the future workforce. So we want to make sure that the next generation of scientists and engineers are immersed in these areas early on in their careers. Electrification is here to stay. We just need to figure out how, what we need to do to make the best of it for the Army. And that's what David is going to talk about next. Good morning, sorry about that. Um, David Friedman, so I'm gonna take a few minutes to talk about uh, some background behind our, our electrification program. We're really trying to do two things at the same time. We're trying to uh, understand the technologies. Um, these technologies have been around for a long time. There's really nothing new about them except the application of these two aircraft and some of the special considerations that you have to have in mind when you do that. Um, and then uh, the other thing we're trying to do is figure out where this fits into uh, uh, Army usage, you know, where, where can we find good use cases where this makes sense to do it. So um, we wouldn't be talking about eVTOL at all if it wasn't for the tremendous uh, improvement in technology over the last several years. So this was first uh, driven by the EV automobile industry, but then picked up by the really large investment in eVTOL as well. So you see uh, improvement here over, over time for electric motors. Uh, it has to do with motor architectures and materials. Um, fuel cells aren't new. They, they flew on the Apollo spacecraft. But uh, application of fuel cells to aircraft and really working the, the, weight, um, the weight improvements that need to be done, that's, that's fairly new. Uh, power electronics also improving mostly due to materials to be able to operate at higher temperatures. And then batteries. So batteries have come a long way, um, and they continue to improve every year. The the trouble with batteries is even even if they continue on this same slope, um, it'll take decades before they catch up with uh, JP8 or, or airplane fuel, which is 50 or 60 times more um, energy dense than than batteries right now. So that's why uh, Dr. Kerr said hybrid is uh, something we're looking at very, very hard. Next slide, please. So when we talk about electrification for aviation, um, you know, the Army has about has three different types of aircraft we might look at. So there's the UAS. Um, at the small level, they're already electric. They're battery uh, operated. Um, some of the Group 3 UAS we're seeing are starting to have hybrid solutions to improve uh, mission performance. And then there's the uh, manned rotorcraft fleet, uh, aircraft we already have. So, you know, they have uh, engines and transmissions already correctly sized for the mission they do. There are potentially are opportunities to improve their power architecture, um, being able to power management, being able to use the power on board more efficiently for, uh, for mission systems and, and payloads. And then today, though, we're talking about eVTOL. So I use that, uh, that phrase or that term a little bit loosely. Uh, so to include, the E is electric, but I include hybrid. And I also uh, like to think of the short takeoff and landing hybrid aircraft as well because the, the use case space is similar and the technologies are, are the same. Um, these aircraft are 
typically four to six passengers or equivalent payload. They use what's called distributed electric propulsion, so you gain some advantage by uh, having multiple electric motors versus one large electric motor. Uh, they, um, they, because of the battery situation, uh, the all electric ones don't don't hover very long. They um, are runway independent, so they take off vertically, but the idea is you get on the wing and you fly and, and cruise as quickly as possible to conserve the battery. So industry has uh, several motivations for uh, working this problem and creating this, this class of aircraft. One of the things that's attractive to us, and I think everybody, is the potential for lower operating sustainment costs. Um, there should be simpler aircraft uh, and should be easier to maintain, use less fuel, so uh, lower ONS costs is, is a big uh, uh, thing that we're, we're interested in. Uh, next slide, please. So how would we use these aircraft? Um, what we're looking for is use cases where a combination of cost and efficiency and mission effectiveness provide some advantage over a um, conventional alternative. Uh, we, we have done some early uh, analysis that, that makes it look like there might be some use cases where th this is cost competitive and provides, uh, s provides us incentive to uh, continue looking at this area. Uh, air movement of, um, of supplies, logistics, is, uh, is one where I think we would start and uh, at, at a right-sized aircraft moving, uh, moving supplies around uh, might offer some real advantage. And then if you had a utilitarian type of aircraft, it could be used as needed for other missions as well. Um, this is a little bit of conjecture or analysis, so you know we need to do uh, experimentation to really um, figure out where this, this fits and, and if it validates some of our ideas. Uh, we need to dial in the right size, the right payload, range, speed, those types of things. And then from an ST standpoint, we can determine if we have the, the technologies to, to make that happen or we need to make further investment. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a picture of our um, what we call our investment framework. The only thing I want to point out on here is uh, for, for the industry partners who are out here, um, you know, right now we're doing a lot of internal analysis and we're reaching out to industry experts to um, learn what we can and using this SBIR program and teaming up with Agility Prime a little bit to do a little bit of funding things now but really anticipate in FY26 the um, funding opportunities to start to grow. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're planning that now and would like to um, you know, talk to industry and help shape that and make sure we get things right. So I'm going to be followed by uh, Brian, who's going to talk about his experience. Good morning, thank you. Oh, I was hoping to avoid feedback. Uh, that's not the spot. Let's try this one. <laughs> it should be off. All right, so I've already been introduced uh, quite well, so I'll just get right to it. This, uh, this picture... Good Lord. All right, this picture is uh, from last month here in Huntsville, uh, just before flying this aircraft, the, the Beta Aaliyah. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that experience and a little bit about electrification in general. Um, I'm getting a ton of feedback. Can we go to the next slide? A little bit higher, maybe? How's that? this okay much better okay great all right so this is uh, a NASA model a construct what they refer to as lift plus cruise it's a uh, it's close to what beta is doing it's the closest model you can see uh, up top there's a an array of uh, electric motors and propellers or rotors and then on the back there's one large electric motor so for the vertical takeoff and landing you've got uh, the electric motors and then in cruise those park and you get your lift from the wing, thrust from that single motor. Now what I flew was conventional takeoff and landing, so that lift kit was not installed. It was just one electric motor in the back. Uh, can go to the next slide, please. So when we're looking at electrification, the motor is, is one of the biggest advantages that we have. 
and power to weight ratio. So if you look in the header information, we're comparing the beta motor to a uh, conventional turbine motor, and the weight savings is, is huge, and it's how we're able to get eight, nine, even 18 motors on a single aircraft. So that's a big advantage. Um, another one is torque availability. You can see that in the chart that uh, you get 100% torque at any RPM. You don't have to spool it up like you have to in a, in a conventional engine. Uh, we've already talked about noise. Uh, these, these aircraft are not silent. There's still a propeller spinning, so there's wind noise, but the motors are quieter and, and it's substantial. Uh, also, potential sustainability, maintainability. Um, with so few moving parts, we're, we're hoping that uh, there'll be some advantages there. Uh, next slide, please. The other thing that we've talked about quite a bit already is the battery. Uh, energy density is, is still not there, but uh, I think all these manufacturers would be quick to tell you that it's improving. And five, ten years from now, you may be able to buy a battery that makes your vehicle better. You know, most vehicles get worse with time. This may be different. Um, another thing is that the weight doesn't change as you fly. Uh, a fuel-powered aircraft gets lighter throughout the flight and center of gravity changes, and so you have to design to that where you store the fuel. With a battery, it's static, right? So there may be some design opportunities there as well. Um, as far as how long you fly, that, that simple math calculation for us simple pilots, that's still the same. It's analogous, right? The, the terms change, but it's still just a division problem. Uh, but there is a big, big important change uh, to that. Uh, next slide, please. So, with my typical aircraft, when I run out of gas, out of usable fuel, the motor shuts off. So, I calculate that point, and then I back out my reserve that I need for my mission. With an electric aircraft, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, it's not a linear draw, and then what happens at the end is quite different. And talking with these manufacturers, not just beta, we've seen a number of different ways to compute that zero point and to figure out where we're gonna start drawing reserve from. But uh, ultimately, we've seen that uh, they're generally pretty conservative, and uh, when we say we're empty, there's actually still some juice in the can. So, um, so that's quite different, quite interesting for us. Um, so like I said, that's how do you compute that, and then how do you display it to the pilot? That's another big question that we have. Uh, next slide, please. So the pilot interface, uh, I'll tell you from my flight, I spent a lot more time on the pilot interface and on flight controls than I did on the motor and the battery. Um, we've seen push-pull tubes, control cables, very conventional stuff. We've seen a lot of fly-by-wire. Within fly-by-wire, we're seeing very different control strategies, especially when you're talking about the vertical piece. There's a lot of different ways to attack that, and so there's a lot of neat designs coming out that, that we're very interested in. There's a whole slew of other things, power distribution, redundancy. Um, it's, it's a lot more than just batteries and motors when it comes to these things, and we're, we're learning a lot. And, and so that's the big footstop, is, is as they're saying, we're, we're putting a little in, but we're getting a lot out of this uh, still at this point. So uh, with that, I guess I'll, I'll turn it over for questions. Um, if you want to click the next slide. All right, any questions? <laughs> yes, sir. Have you given any consideration to op-tempo with respect to the charge Did y'all hear the question? Well, so for one thing, uh, if, if we're talking about hybrid aircraft, um, you know, the recharge capability will be on the aircraft itself. Um, with batteries, there are cycle life issues, uh, and then batteries keep keep improving. But yeah, those are the types of things that we're looking at in our S&T program. Don't have all the answers yet for sure. Other questions? So can you talk about where do you think we'll see some of the first applications? Based on what we've done so far, where do you think we'll see electrification or hybrid electrification in our aircraft? Well, I think the first application will probably be in um, uh, UAS, probably class th gr or group three UAS. Uh, for this EV tall type of aircraft that we're talking about, a little bigger, um, you know, it could be some sort of CONUS uh, VIP movement aircraft or, or um, local uh, supply movement, but. Uh, 
operationally, I think the, the logistics resupply is probably the, the place to start. So another possible application is that we learn some new things from these electric aircraft, but then we can apply those to conventional aircraft. Maybe use some of the actuators designed for eVTOL on conventional aircraft, maybe use them for uh, vibration reduction or noise reduction or even control. And that's an, another area that's still in basic research, but uh, definitely has potential where it can have a much broader application beyond just purely electric VTOL or even hybrid uh, electric VTOL. Any in the audience? So the question was, what do we know about the longevity of these batteries? How often will we have to replace them? So that, that very much depends on which manufacturer we're talking about, and that's that's absolutely one of the questions that we're asking with, with each of them. Uh, I would say it's three to five years, but exactly how much uh, remains to be seen. Um, but uh, the degradation so far seems to be actually a lot, a lot less than we anticipated. Okay, well that uh, concludes our presentation this morning, so appreciate your attendance and have a rest of the show, have a great rest of your show.
That's funny. Cushing's here. Don't worry. He's there, but Cushing's standing right over there. Because you're like pretty bashing. So I don't know. I don't know when he was running. Gentlemen, welcome to the Warriors Corner. Second topic for this morning. Uh, Major General Tom O'Connor, Commanding General, Aviation and Missile Command, will present 
choose AMCOM organic and industrial based capabilities. We will start at 9.45. Thank you. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. We will get started in two minutes, so please gather around, get a seat, and stand by. Ladies and gentlemen, our next Warrior Corner topic, Choose AMCOM Organic Industrial Base Capabilities, presented by Major General Tom O'Connor, Commanding General, Aviation and Missile Command. Please welcome him. Hey, good morning, everyone. There we go. 
Uh, so uh, first and foremost, it's uh, my distinct honor to be here today uh, representing the 12,000 AMCOM employees that are globally positioned around the world uh, to support our war fighters and enable the joint force uh, by enabling their readiness across the board. Uh, so again, it's my honor. I'd also like to uh, take this opportunity uh, to, to thank uh, AUSA, uh, certainly General Brown, the entire staff, for all the hard work to uh, put this event together. It's been a wonderful opportunity uh, for all of us to collaborate, uh, to innovate, to, to discuss, to understand perspectives, ideas, thoughts, you know, and ways forward. So I just want to say thank you to the AUSA staff. I'd also be remiss if I didn't thank the sponsors, uh, I didn't thank the exhibitors, I certainly didn't thank industry, uh, the Huntsville community, uh, for opening their arms and really opening their ideas and thoughts uh, for all of us to share while we're here today. So with that being said, uh, I'd like to uh, dive uh, right into a couple of discussions uh, for today and then open up for any questions that you might have across the board. So uh, first and foremost, go to the next slide please. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you know, really what we've been hyper-focused on, uh, just kind of trying to figure how we can help reduce the burden on the top of the units. How we can improve their material readiness to ensure that they're standing ready to deter regional aggression and, uh, and if uh, deterrence fails to be able to fight and win our nation's wars. And uh, by doing that, you know, we think through, you know, some of the challenges that exist across the board. We think through some of the opportunities that are out there and some of the things that we need to do to help innovate uh, to ensure that we're continuously modernizing, reforming, changing, but we're also uh, supporting uh, those soldiers that are in the fight uh, today. That's in there. One of the things that uh, we've been able to successfully do and continue to do is to leverage uh, some technology, uh, some new technology, uh, whether it be blue light scanning, uh, whether it be laser alignment tools, uh, whether it be cold spray, uh, to help uh, take that new technology and repair forward. Uh, anytime that we can have a depot team deploy forward, uh, it reduces the cost uh, and the delay uh, by shipping uh, those major end items, those combat weapon systems back uh, to a depot or a major maintenance facility across the board. Uh, and, then it, and it truly enables readiness uh, uh, for the units by returning combat power, critical enablers and critical combat power uh, to the warfighter more rapidly across the board. We've got uh, tons of examples across the board, but uh, you know everything from battle crash damage repairs, uh, everything from just structural you know, corrosion uh, prevention across the board, uh, things that uh, we're doing to help enable them uh, and, and, and really return uh, the weapon systems uh, to its warfighting capabilities, supporting the warfighter forward across the board. But again, this saves time, money, and, uh, and it improves readiness where we're at. The other thing we're uh, hyper-focused on is uh, how do we close the experience gap? You know, the experience gap of, uh, of our soldiers, our maintainers, and really our, even our artisans at the, the depots across the board. You know, uh, we all live through the global pandemic. Uh, we all recognize the challenges for talent across the board. You know, we recognize that uh, post-pandemic, you know, with uh, you know, the, the, the amount of work force you know, drain across the board. We've had some loss in uh, capability with uh, some of our vendors, you know, have chosen to move on to do other things. How do we close some of that gaps? Uh, the fight for talent is real, uh, and we're working very hard to help minimize some of the gap. Uh, just at uh, Corpus Christi and Letter County, two of our depots, uh, just in the last month, we've had artisans retire after 50 years of service. It's 50 years of service to our nation. It's 50 years of knowledge, experience, expertise, you know, that uh, we're trying to onboard new uh, individuals, recruit, retain, uh, and then also train uh, train them uh, to ensure that they're able to perform those tasks well. Also, closing the experience gap with our soldiers. You know, the, the Army, you know, has a constant turnover of individuals and soldiers across the board. You know, how do we onboard them? How do we enable them uh, to maintain uh, the complex weapon systems that we have to ensure, you know, that they are ready to fight and win uh, when asked to do so? Part of some of these innovative solutions is leveraging uh, telemaintenance, uh, leveraging a high velocity training, uh, digitization of our work structures, you know, finding a way to, to leverage uh, you know, some uh, automated systems, automated work structure instructions, uh, visualization tools, 3D modeling, uh, to enable to onboard them, educate them, and then give them an opportunity to work through, rehearse, and really train on some of the maintenance tasks that we ask them to do 
uh, before they have the opportunity. We've been very successful at it, uh, and we've had some great results. And but of course, you know, there's still more to do in this area. And as we think through the future, we think through uh, what tools, what equipment, what equipment sets do we need. Uh, we talk through uh, virtual reality glasses, you know, a way where we can get uh, some of our, you know, uh, engineers, you know, from across the enterprise to be able to communicate and visualize and look, you know, through the eyes of the mechanic. I work through our maintenance engineering changes. We're working through some opportunities to again repair as far forward as we can, without actually having to have an engineer out, you know, in a, a company or a platoon, tactical assembly area across the board. Uh, but this is the technology that we know we need. Uh, this is the type of the innovation that uh, we're pursuing and looking forward to, you know, to onboard. Uh, these are the places where we think we can help reduce and close uh, some of the experience gap that we have across the board. When it's all said and done, you know, uh, data, you know, data-informed decisions, you know, certainly is, is enabling us to, to act with, a, you know, with a more precision and more speed, more efficiently across the board. You know, and there's places and spaces that we have lots of data, we just don't have that data in the right, in the right spot, you know, at the right time. So it's trying to figure out how do we manage that data, how do we transport that data, how do we communicate that across the board. You'll hear, you know, you've heard uh, throughout the, this entire week, uh, multiple individuals talking about uh, precision logistics and understanding that of the drive commander's decisions at Echelon, you know, across the board. And I'll just talk about a few of them. So uh, our weapon systems, uh, we've been sending digital traffic for years. You know, digital traffic for 20, 25 years uh, from, from the cockpits, you know, from vehicles that are in the tactical units back to their tactical assembly areas. And some of those, uh, you know, some of that traffic has, you know, our fuel status, our ammo status. Uh, it's it's coming off of our combat platforms, and it's sitting, you know, in the tactical unit. What we need to move forward on is taking that data and transporting it from an enterprise solution back to the enterprise to ensure that we can see and understand at echelon. Uh, the days of the, the the digital log stats or the Excel spreadsheets passing off of an email you know, back to a unit at Echelon, you know, when they're moving and in contact in the, in the EW environment, sometimes becomes delayed, you know, uh, irrelevant or two to three days uh, behind. Uh, we need to figure a way to get that data in real time back uh, to at Echelon so we can make decisions at Echelon across the board. Some of our investments across the enterprise are developing some of these digital tools uh, that we just fielded in the UH6, uh, in the, in the AH64, um, a data tool that allows maintainers to get real-time vibration analysis, temperature, you know, uh, some indications in the cockpit, again, to the mechanic at the tactical assembly area. Uh, so at the tactical edge, I think we've done a really good job of, you know, communicating and pushing data. It's getting it from the tactical edge back to the enterprise to ensure that we can understand trends, you know, without having to have a crew chief download you know, put a computer up to an aircraft, you know, stick a thumb drive in, uh, put it onto a transport device and send it back. We probably need to order, automate that and think through how do we automate the communication of data from the tactical edge back to the enterprise to ensure that we can be predictive uh, with our sustainment requirements uh, and enable us in a secure environment to anticipate requirements as, uh, as we continue to move forward and find it. I know, uh, Colonel Upton talked yesterday, uh, and we've all experienced, you know, the, the log stats and the, the Hemets, you know, taking the three meter stick and sticking it in the back of a Hemet, you know, to determine how much fuel is actually in that Hemet, you know, it was a little bit antiquated. And then certainly that log stack making it back to Tox and command posts at Echelon to ensure that we're not sending combat logistical patrols full of fuel to deliver to a unit that can't receive it because they have more fuel than we anticipated. Uh, so real-time data will really help help enable us to be more precise, you know, with our uh, with our delivery of, of supplies. And it's not just fuel; it's water, it's ammo, you know, it's Class Nine parts. You know, as much as we can automate and digitize the, the, the sustainment apparatus, you know, it'll sure en enable us to ensure that we uh, deliver material uh, at the point of need uh, to ensure that we can sustain combat readiness moving forward. So with that being said, you know, there's certainly a, a lot of uh, challenges across the board, but uh, it's really about delivering, uh, delivering sustainment and material forward uh, to the units in the field uh, to ensure they can sustain revenues. 
But in order to do that, we've got to continuously modernize our efforts across the board. We've got to continuously modernize, you know, uh, everything from our depots uh, with the OEMs back to the foxholes to ensure that not only are we deal with new material, but we're material, material that's sustainable and reliable moving forward. One of the places uh, that we're looking to, to modernize in the future, and I know Ms. Wicker talked uh, yesterday about uh, the OIB modernization program and efforts that are ongoing. And I'd just like to highlight just a few of them. When you think through uh, the organic industrial base, uh, the two of them that fall under our command at AMCOM is uh, Letterkenny Depot in Chainsburg, Pennsylvania, and Corpus Christi Army Depot uh, out in Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, both of those facilities were built in 1941 and 1942, respectively. You know, in 1941, a hangar that was uh, in a facility that was built to, to uh, overhaul and repair seaplanes is not necessarily meeting the needs to sustain the current uh, fleet of equipment that we have, but also set the conditions uh, to, for the future fleet. Very similar in Letterkenny, you know, built in 1942, you know, again, not necessarily optimized to support uh, the current weapon systems that we have and the future weapon systems you know, that we know are along. One of the places that we're looking uh, to uh, modernize at Letterkenny is with an anechoic chamber. You know, one that allows us to drive drive in, you know, some of our larger radar systems across the board. You know, this investment will enable us to tool and meet the, the tooling requirements to support our weapon systems in the future. And again, an anechoic chamber, you know, allows us to sustain and return back to the fight uh, our weapon systems. You know, the weapon systems that we, we know we need to, to fight moon on the future battlefield. Go to the next slide real quick. Very, very similar at, uh, at CCAD. Again, a lot of investment across uh, CCAD just to ensure that uh, we're modernizing their facilities, uh, to ensure that we've uh, updated the infrastructure, you know, the IT networks. Uh, we've updated the training and onboarding of our individuals across the board. We're building the facilities and the tooling to support, you know, a efficient flow of, of repair an agile flow of repair to ensure we set the conditions to repair the components of today and set the conditions for the components that we know we'll have to repair in the future across the board. If you think about the depot and what the depot does, what the depots do uh, for a force, they repair and return components. Right? They're repairing components you know, uh, to put them back in the field to enable our readiness. They're saving the Army money uh, and they're building readiness across time. Instead of having to buy new components, we're fixing them and we're sending them back. If you think through uh, some of our battle damaged uh, uh, aircraft, you know, it's about 20% the cost uh, for an Apache to get fixed versus going out and buying a new one. Uh, about the same for uh, Blackhawks and Chinooks across the board. You know, and it varies depending on the battle damage across the board, you know, anywhere from 20 to 50 to 49%, depending on what we have to do. But if we could repair and return, we're saving the taxpayer money, we're putting readiness back in the field, and we're also doing it at a faster pace than getting into the uh, production process, depending on ongoing procurement requirements across the board. Uh, that alone is generating combat power and it's putting weapon systems uh, back in the hands of our warfighters. On the component side of the house, the amount of components uh, that are repaired are, are saving, again, the Army money. Instead of buying new engines or transmissions, we're overhauling and we're repairing them. We're getting them returned back to the field in a manner that enables uh, the units uh, to install them and put them back on aircraft to ensure that they can maintain the readiness. Or our Patriot uh, radar systems. Our ADA systems are critically important to the defense you know, of and protection of our soldiers and our allies across the globe. You know, actively employed in many places uh, today. You know, that Patriot system and uh, uh, all of our ADA systems are saving lives. You know, our air defense systems require overhaul, maintenance, and sustainment. When you run generators and radars for 365 days a year, you bring them back, you overhaul them, you ensure that they're ready to meet the readiness requirements for the future deployments across the board. Again, uh, you know, we're, we're certainly happy, you know, with uh, what the depots do in terms of capability and capacity, you know, but uh, we're also looking for partnerships uh, across the board with the OEMs. There are plenty of processes and capabilities that we have uh, at the strategic, you know, reserve of our nation, which is our depots, 
that provide you know, an insurance policy to ensure we can surge to meet wartime requirements. But there's opportunities for industry across the board, uh, for industry to invest in, to uh, gain into private-public partnerships or customer support agreements, uh, to leverage that workforce, the capital investment, you know, the capabilities and the processes that we have at our depots with our artisans. And when the business case makes sense, you know, it's a win-win for everybody. It gives our artisans, the sets and the reps, uh, to work on their skills. It allows us to share best practices across the board, and it truly enables us to return our components and, and major end items uh, back to the force in a timely enough manner to ensure that we can support the readiness requirements across the board. Next slide. Just like to highlight a few of those things uh, as you think about the world-class, you know, uh, plating, uh, our wiring capabilities, our cold spray, advanced manufacturing capabilities that we have at our depot. Um, these are processes that industry can leverage the secure networks you know, that we have, you know, which will provide some opportunities uh, for industry, all industry, to kind of look at and explore and see what Lever Canyon and, and Corpus Christi can provide for you in, in terms of reducing some of your uh, long lead time parts or long lead time processes offer alternate sources of repair and in some cases alternate sources of supply uh, as we enter some uh, customer support agreements with, with the team. Next slide please. I'd also be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to talk about some of the other depot cap capabilities that are out there. I wouldn't be a good AMC teammate if I didn't uh, you know, brag about uh, uh, TakeCom and Seacom in particular, you know, Toby Hanna has got some incredible capabilities, uh, but uh, so does TACOM, whether it be uh, Red River, Rock Island, uh, you name it. If you're not familiar with some of the depot capabilities, I'd ask you to take a look at and see what options and opportunities are in there. I know in the aerospace industry, there's some significant challenges associated with castings and forgings in particular, advanced manufacturing capabilities. Uh, well, Rock Island has got some a tremendous amount of capabilities, not only today, but they're also investing into the future. And if you can look from everything from 3D printing, uh, from powder-based fusion, from you know sand, uh, sand uh, printing as well, uh, they've got polymer printing, uh, they've got certainly the castings and fordings for multiple metals you know, across the board. There's plenty of opportunities uh, to look at and mitigate the risks within the supply chain to ensure that we can leverage, you all can leverage that to ensure that you need you know, delivery schedules associated with the components that are part of, part of the team. Next slide. Before I go into questions, I just want to highlight just a couple of other quick quick things across the board. So one of our challenges is ensuring that uh, we are delivering the material that uh, we have procured and put on purchase order requests uh, to the warfighter to enable their readiness across the board. And I would ask industry to kind of think through a few things. Uh, one of them is when you, when you look around this room, you see some incredible capability. You know some some innovation, you know, in solving some of our uh, critical problems that we have as a joint force. But I'd ask you to think through, how do we sustain this capability, and how do we make it so it's reliable? Because great systems and great capability aren't really worth anything in a soldier's hand if it's not ready, it's not reliable, uh, and, uh, and they can't sustain it. So I'd ask you, not only are you innovating to solve some of these problems, but you think through, how do we sustain it? Uh, how do we make it more reliable? How do we reduce the mean time between failure? How do we reduce the burden on these soldiers in the field that are counting on us to deliver capable equipment for them so they can deter aggression and fight and win if asked to do so? Last thing I'll say is this will defend, you know, and it's all about them today out there on the front lines in those tactical formations and those that will be out there in the future. Uh, with that being said, I'll open up for any questions. Fixing forward, and sometimes that's a, a thing that you have to do because in some of the environments we're going to be fighting in, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult for you to extract your helicopters or a HIMARS or a Patriot out of theater to send back to depot. And you talked about sending capabilities forward, and they're doing some of that now with the Ukrainians, where they're doing remote, uh, remote te like tele maintenance with the Ukrainians, providing the, uh, the support for them to do some of that in theater. Given the constraints of the public environment here, could you talk a little bit more about how you see 
that pushing depot capabilities forward in the theater for this kind of thing? No, that's a great question, right? So, so a few things. I mean, you think back through World War II, how many uh, supply ships, you know, were sunk, you know, in the Pacific or Atlantic Oceans. You know, so our, you know, and you, and you talk about contested logistics, you know, so we know that we're going to be living in a contested logistic environment, you know, uh, if, if we ever have to face a, a future conflict across the board. So how do you minimize the burden, you know, on that entire distribution network, uh, bringing Patriot weapon systems back here or ADA or exquisite weapon systems back, puts it at risk, takes it out of the fight for a long period of time. So we want to repair forward as much as we can across the board. And telemaintenance is nothing new. Uh, we were doing it in Afghanistan, you know, for the last 25 years. You know, we we're, we're continue to do it, you know, across the world. You know, uh, we, we do it in, even in the U.S. Army. We've got our great engineers, you know, a liaison engineers that's out there on the phone all the time talking to our Lars forward in the field who's talking to the units that are out there. So telemaintenance has been around for a while. How do, we, how do we make it you know, modernized and make it more effective across the board? Uh, well, one, I think there's opportunities uh, to, to uh, resolve some, maybe some 3D, you know, or maybe some uh, uh, augmented reality lenses or glasses as part of a standard issue toolbox, you know, where I can get on, you know, I can get on an, an aircraft or a Patriot system, uh, I can put a headset on, I can call back to my friend Keith Darrow and say, Keith, I can't figure this out, and you know Keith gives me some great advice on how to troubleshoot and how to fix it across the board. You know, so I think uh, that's that's part of the future. Um, I think also uh, automating and digitizing some of our, you know, our, uh, our basically our dash tens, you know, our maintenance manuals, and having a me mechanic that having the ability to actually walk through in a 3D model, you know, to see what the maintenance repair would be would help that. In 2019, uh, uh, the Department of Defense signed some agreements, you know, uh, with uh, some nations to uh, think through what would a depot forward look like in certain regions, you know, and certainly there is intellectual property discussions, you know, but it's part of a theater security, uh, security cooperation agreement, you know, to understand where we can put uh, our TASMs, you know, forward and, and occupy some depot space uh, to help repair and reduce the, the burden of, of moving equipment back. And they only bring it back, you know, when we have to. But some of the things I talked about is uh, laser alignment tools, you know. So what are the tools that we need that only exist in the depot? And how can we digitize them or reduce the burden by bringing them, bringing them forward? I didn't really talk about it today, but another place is uh, uh, our test diagnostic and measurement, you know, uh, equipment. You know, so every torque wrench has to get, you know, has, has to get calibrated. You know, but the thing that calibrates the torque wrench has to get calibrated by something else, which has to get calibrated by something else. So that whole network is requiring a shipping material back and forth. We talk about precision navigation and timing. You know, everything that we do on communication, you know, uh, down to maintenance has some sort of precision instrument that's required to ensure that we can fight and win forward. So how do we move that far forward as well? Where do we innovate with NIST? on a chip or how do we develop and, and reduce the requirement to move material back and forth. Um, I, I think those are some of the places where you know we can move teams forward. This last year we sent 99 depot uh, repair teams forward to go repair uh, weapon systems forward. The more tools that we have to do that, the more opportunities will be to, to ensure that we can keep those weapon systems from having to come back. Great question, thank you. Yes, sir. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. About 15 years ago, the OIB transitioned to LMP, which was not an easy transition, with EBSC um, coming down sooner rather than later that converges LMP, GCSS Army, ACIPUB, GFEVS into one end to end with minimal customization. I see the challenge is going to be more on the OIB workforce than the tactical workforce. So just interested in how AMC and OIB is leaning forward for that change management task going forward. Now, sure, that's a great question and it's a great point. I mean, change is always hard, right? You know, it's a cultural thing you have to overcome. It's ensuring that we uh, set the conditions to uh, enable uh, that transition uh, to occur. 
you know, and then that's the testing. It's the you know, it's the validation of those requirements, and that uh, that the, the systems are, are talking to each other, communicating the verification of data, you know, across the board. Uh, I will tell you that the team is uh, hyperly engaged, you know, on, on trying to ensure that uh, we secure the data, we test the data, we're running the data, you know, and then we're making sure that those communication links um, exist in a manner that enables us to see ourselves uh, and operate uh, to support the requirements. But I do think that the impact is certainly going to be on the enterprise side of the house, you know, more so with the tactical units. But I'll also tell you when, you know, in the tactical unit, when we went to G Army, you know, there was GRM, there was a blockout period. I mean, it, but we've done this before, over and over again. It's just uh, as we continue to evolve. But what, what the, the benefit is, is when we have systems that can communicate and talk to each other, you know, and we converge them, then you don't have all these stovepipe one-offs. And, you know, just to try, I mean, I can't take a PowerPoint slide and change it to a PDF without the font changing, right? So, you know, as we think through these enterprise solutions, you want to make sure that, that transition occurs uh, as soon as, as possible. Uh, but I would tell you, sir, it's uh, informing the requirements and then the, the deliberate and validation of the testing is the only way that we're going to manage that transition. Great question, yes, sir. And of course, every transition is a concern, right? That's where risk is. Every commander has been taught something, but too or the risk is always in transition. So what are you doing to help mitigate the, the transition uh, and ensure that it, it comes to, um, to support the, the requirements? Great, thank you, sir. Any other questions? Perfect. Well, thank you all very much uh, for your time. Thank you for what you do. And just uh, remember, it's all about supporting the
the
tired of the ball. I just feel like Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Warriors Corner final panel presentation. The next panel will start at 10.30. The topic is C2 and Network Transformation at Project Convergence Capstone 4. Uh, the net Network CFT team, along with PEO C3 team, will present with uh, Major General Jet Ray presenting. Thank you. 
Welcome to the Warriors Corner. The next topic is C2 and network transformation at Project Convergence Capstone 4. Please welcome on the stage General Ray with his team from Network CFT and PEO C3T. No, no clapping. No welcome to General Ray and his team. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Hey, hey good morning. And, um, so again, we just stopped by real quickly. We want to share with you a couple things that we learned uh, at Project Convergence. Now, we're not going to give you the full rollout. We're just going to give you some things that were done there. Uh, I think I'll open up specifically, uh, and those who don't know me, I'm the Network Cross Functional Team Director up at Aberdeen Proven Ground. And, uh, so I'll open up with three particular things uh, about PC. So Project Convergence 22, and now PC Capstone 4. So what did we learn? We brought in a lot of our ally partners and even some of our coalition partners were part of this, uh, this particular experiment as well. So we, we took a, a lot deeper dive. We really looked into data, we looked into the architecture and really tried to understand it a little bit more. The second thing that we looked at was the, the actual network architecture itself. We thought it was more adaptive this time. One of the challenges that I, um, I posed on, on the whole team was 99% of the time the network is stable. Tell me specifically what was happening at Project Convergence. What did we plug in? What did we add to? What configuration changes we made? 
that cause issues with the network. And I think you'll hear a little bit of that uh, from Colonel Fist as she talks through some things that uh, that we that we learned out there. And then and then the last the last part of, of what we actually want to see is how did how does all this align? So when we looked at project convergence and we looked at transformation in contact and we look at our soldier touch points that we make, we see alignment all the way through and through. Uh, the things that were learned out there, what we're going to learn in trans, uh, trans, uh, transformation in contact, and what the outcomes are going to be in the future. So I, I think that alignment is there as well. So I'm going to just pass the mic over to Colonel Fisk, who's going to kind of lay out. She was the G6 on the ground at uh, Project Convergence, and uh, she owned the network. So here we go. Thank you, sir. Good morning. My name is uh, Colonel Heather Fisk, and I'm the Director of Network Integration at Joint Modernization Command. And I'm excited to be done with Capstone 4 and to be able to share with you guys some of the success um, that we achieved this year. So Project Convergence 22, um, we made some progress with our multinational partner integration, and our UK and Australia partners were part of that. So the focus for Capstone 4 this year was to increase our multinational partner integration. So this year we had our UK, Australian, New Zealand, Canada, the French, and the Japanese participating in our Capstone event this year. So we made some significant progress with integration of our multinational partners, specifically with our information sharing. So our intelligence, our fires, and our common operational picture. Some significant um, integration, and we were able to enable from sensor to shooter those message traffic to pass natively, automated, not through a manual input from sensor to shooter, whether it's a multinational partner or whether it's a U.S. So from U.S. to multinational partner and multinational to U.S. using some technologies that we experimented with called cross-domain solutions. So that enabled us to improve our combined joint all-domain command and control um, through the Capstone 4 network to enable that sensor to shooter um, traffic to pass at an accelerated rate. This also made it, uh, enabled us to have a common shared common operational picture and our, our common intelligence picture which we were not able to achieve in uh, 22. So with our advances with the combined joint all domain command and control we were able to see a greater level of synchronization with our partners and with our joint partners as well so we had the navy air force and marines participating with us as well this was the first year that we partnered with the global information dominance exercise as well um, and what did we what did capstone 4 bring to the table with that partnership so we were able to integrate um, some of these technologies and advanced our multi-domain fires effects as well so we were able to experiment with some technologies on uh, multi-domain um, battle management command and control. And so what does project convergence bring to the existing global information dominance experience, experiment excuse me, is the fact that they were able to integrate from a strategic down to a tactical network um, from an echelon one, so a combatant command, all the way down to a, a division level and to accelerate our ability, again, sensor to shooter um, capabilities. And then we also, you know, are, are always trying to achieve greater data centricity. So we had some technologies that were more data-centric technologies integrated into our network as well. That enabled us to use some of the enterprise, the Army enterprise data platforms and some commercial sources to enable commanders on the ground to have more data-driven decision-making and also that improved our ability for combined joint all-domain situational awareness. So those are some of the great successes that I want to share with you that we were able to achieve in Project Convergence Capstone 4. Again, capitalizing on some of our successes in 22 and continuing to make progress. Speaking of making progress, I'm going to hand the mic over to Mike next who's going to talk to you about, I am, I am what I like to refer to as command and control now how do we integrate these great technologies into today's network? And, and Mike gets the great job of talking about our next generation command and control. Good morning, uh, Colonel Mike Kalusian. I, uh, I co-lead an initiative titled Next Generation Command and Control Warfighting Capabilities for General Rain uh, at AFC headquarters in Austin. So this is all, that's one thing, but this is all part of a greater team that's getting after 
What, what is C2 going to look like in the future? What do our commanders need for C2 in the future in order for them to compete and to win against a sophisticated peer adversary and large-scale combat operations? So that's really what this is all about, and we couldn't do it without the partners that are sitting to my left and right. So at PCC4, we had an opportunity, initial proof of concept, to say, can we seamlessly, at real time, share data amongst multiple platforms and multiple operating systems, and we proved that we could do that. So that's a huge functionality there to be able to say, hey, if I'm on a TAC device or, or I'm on a, some other operating system, we should be able to pass that data seamlessly, and, and, and we were able to achieve that. So that was a success. The next step in this whole process is, how do we take that now and take this ability, if we're going to be truly data-centric, how can we be data-centric in a, in a contested environment? What does it look like in a DDO? Once again, we know we're going to operate, in, operate um, in an environment someday where the enemy is going to take some of these things away from us. So we have to be ready for what that looks like. What are some of the minimal viable standards that we're going to have to have for our C2 capabilities in the future? And that's what we really need to organize and engineer to. General Rainey has told me, and this is, he needs three things in order to fight. He needs voice, he needs fires, and he needs cop. At a very minimum, he needs to do that. So we need to be able to show from a high fidelity standpoint, here's what we were able to show at PC, here's what we can do in the way that we can seamlessly share data across platforms, and here's what it would look like from a, we'll just say, low fidelity standpoint if we're going to be contested in the, in the EMS. So really our next sprint, our next kind of proof of concept is, is actually a, you know, aggressing and, and, and having an EMS contested battle space where we can prove these technologies and to see what we can actually really do. So we are just really starting off this initiative. It's pretty, pretty exciting. We all know about SD-WAN and transport agnostic. We talk about it all the time. Obviously, it's super crucial for the way that we're going to move forward. I think the way we need to be thinking about this in the future, based on some of the lessons that we have learned and understanding what the enemy is going to try to take away from us, we really need full network autonomy. Ultimately, that's where we need to be, right? So we don't need our commanders our signal you know, personnel and our experts to be trying to figure out, combat is gonna to be too fast in the future. So we have to figure out what does is, what is full network autonomy look like and how can we ensure that our network is adapting real time without, without human in the loop um, input so we can ensure that we're gonna be successful and be able to fight through anything that the enemy is gonna to try to do to us in the future. General Rainey also mentioned yesterday, if you had a chance to, to listen in on his keynote, HMI human-machine integrated formations. So not only do we have to figure out how we're gonna fight as humans against a pure adversary in the future, we also have to figure out, we're gonna have an exponential increase in sensors. So we've gotta figure out what does that look like, how do we take the data off of those sensors and incorporate, incorporate it quickly into any C2 system that we're gonna have. That's gonna be crucial. And we don't need a network that's only for the humans, we need a network that's gonna also be for the robots. We're gonna have robots, we're gonna have autonomous, semi-autonomous platforms, and they're gonna have sensors. And so we've gotta figure out, we've never had this challenge before, so when we think through IoT, this is certainly an area that we have to put a lot of emphasis based on some of those lessons learned. As I mentioned, the next, where we're moving to is, is a NetMod X exercise that'll occur this fall. And from there, General Rainey's vision is a proof of principle will occur at Project Com uh, Convergence Capstone 5 next spring. And then after that, we start talking requirements, and that's where we really pass this over to our acquisition professionals like Mr. Kitts. So, thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. <clears throat> How's everybody doing? I hope this works. Um, how's everybody doing? Last Warrior Corner. Everybody's excited? Excited? Yeah? Yeah? All right. I was excited when I got here, and then the very first boss I ever had in the army showed up, and I know she's grading me right now, and so I'm gonna. I, I got. I got. I got a little nervous. Um, no, thanks for me. Um, so, so I'm, I'm glad everybody's excited. I, I, I am, I, as you know, I am really excited about the future of the network. And we are we, when when Mike's talking about a holistic network and, and integrating our C2, our transport agnostic, these concepts, uh, I, I, I couldn't be more excited. And I think you and industry should should be equally excited because there are, are going to be unique opportunities across a large landscape 
Uh, and so when we put it in context of, of Capstone 4, you know, a couple of things I wanted to talk about that I think are real opportunities for industry that we're, we're learning from Capstone and then bringing those opportunities for industry to, to deliver capability. Uh, first is in our data, right? And, and we talked, I, I, I did the very first Warrior Corner here, I'm doing the last one, and the very first one was on our data mesh and, and being able to service data. And whatever we do for our C2 systems, uh, whatever capability is, is, is gonna come out of this pilot, what underpins all of that is our data architecture and the data mesh. And so we're gonna see real opportunities here. So 1012 has an opportunity on API orchestration. Uh, we're gonna look at 1013, an opportunity on our, on our, I'll call a data fabric plus. How do we get on the road to a data mesh? Uh, I think these are real opportunities for industry to, 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 to get after. Um, the second thing that you'll, you'll see as a common theme across the panel here is our fires architecture. Our fires architecture is very old, antiquated, and complicated. And so how do we simplify a data-centric fires architecture that does not trade any of the critical aspects of our of safety and, and you know, everybody says a fate tids is old. Yeah, but, but you know what a fate tids does? It works every time. Right? And so we've got to have a fires architecture that our fires community is confident in and is mo modernized in this data-centric way. And I think that's a real unique challenge to industry. And I'm really encouraged because, because I, I think that community's only had one or two or three industry partners excited about fires. Now I'm really starting to see commercial and, and other uh, industry partners get excited because we are serious about modernizing our, and simplifying that fires architecture. Another area of investment coming out of Capstone is, is, is you couldn't walk three steps without running into a cross-domain solution. And, and so, so we are going to invest in our cross-domain solutions. We are going to do raise the bar compliance, um, but we are looking at small form factor, flexible cross-domain solutions that simplify our architecture. And so look, look forward to that. Uh, and, and the last thing I want to hit, and I, I kind of talk about this at, at every time, and, and you heard it across the panel here, especially from Mike and John Ray, we have got to have a network, a future network that is adaptable, which means every program in my portfolio has got to embrace that adaptability. Uh, some of the technologies and capabilities that we talk about today didn't exist two years ago. And so I can't have a five-year contract with industry that doesn't acknowledge this rapid pace of innovation, this, this need for our commanders to adapt their network. And that, I think, is the challenge between us and industry to get to those uh, flexible and adaptable contracts and means of doing business. And with that, I'll look forward to your questions. Thanks. Hello. Victor Vega, I'm working networks, especially satellite communications, SD WAN, et cetera. Um, as far as PC4, you mentioned uh, some things that enabled the, the talking of the different uh, systems that were, you know, up to now maybe staying alone or didn't talk to each other. What were, you know, maybe the top two uh, tools that enabled that? You know, you mentioned SD WAN was a common waveforms. Um, you know, maybe some uh, a cloud. You know, and, and were those commercial? Uh, with specific vendors, or was it Army-owned things? So, specifically, some of the things that we integrated into Capstone 4 that weren't uh, integrated into PC-22 is, as, as you may have seen in the opening video, the HMI, the robotics. Um, so those were integrated into the network as well, so we could receive, um, in some cases, um, live video feed or PLI, and also our um, autonomous aircrafts as well. So UASs were also integrated into the network. So that, that with it brought, we brought them in through the TSM network, so a um, Trellisware um, software-based network uh, into, the net, into the Capstone 4 network. So existing technology was used to bring in the new technology into the Capstone 4 network. Um, which then brought us to a, a new challenge as well, all the data associated with these, all, all these new technologies that were brought into our network. Hey, just want to say I uh, appreciate the panel for coming down here. Uh, a lot of work. Uh, this has been done. A lot of work to be done. Uh, can you talk about some of the Gen AI and the predictive data analytics you guys 
are going to put on top of the data, the clean data once you get it. Can, can you talk to that? I reached for the mic thinking I was going to say something really, really innovative, and I, I hope I, I think I'm going to disappoint you. Um, but I, what, we have got to start with the basics. We can't race to AI and ML when we are not even storing, cataloging, and understanding the data that we have. And so uh, I think we've got to start with foundational basics about um, um, getting the data architecture right, and then asking questions of that data, which which could en be enabled by ML AI, right? Um, the other thing is, AI and ML is, is sort of at the dichotomy of, of being able to shoot and move quickly, right? Uh, we, can't, we, we can't be dumping a, a, a bunch of server stacks in a brigade's talk anymore, right? So, so if we have to move, how do we best leverage some of these algorithms and capabilities? I think that's another challenge that we have to industry, right? We can't sit there and label data in a brigade, right? So how do we, how do we get those models out there that leverage the data that we have? Um, so, so I think our start on that journey is really at the data level, and then asking industry, okay, how do I ask questions of that data? Hey, so Scott, great question. So one of the things that I think we learned out there also is that where is our data located and where do we need it to be? And I think if one of the discussions I had with the team out there was, hey, we fight at the COCOM level. So regionalizing, the data that we require in order to conduct the fight is probably the first conversation we need to have. And then how do we interconnect those particular regional sites so we can replicate on the data and utilize it and then point to the data uh, with our systems of systems. I think that's, that's one thing we learned out there and I think that's the conversation we're going to begin to have. guys excited or you want to go get something to drink? Any other questions for the team? Oh, I got one right here. Um, in my past as an Army aviator, I found out that sometimes, this is a long time ago, of course, but um, back when I was in, in the Army, um, sometimes we'd find out that the ground force had a great system for its time, but when aviators were trying to talk to the guys on the ground, which often becomes very important to do that, we had we found that it really wasn't designed for that. Hopefully, we've have, we've overcome that problem. It's really encouraging to hear that you're working with uh, uh, the joint force. I hope, which is the next step, and then combined forces with our allies. Uh, so the question really begins when you talk about this uh, progress that we're making, which is so important to the next battle. Uh, are we are we connecting all the parts that I just described? Uh, I'd kind of like to get a sense of that. Thank you. I'm just going to disappoint you up front, and then I'll let the experts answer the question. We haven't solved the problem yet. You haven't been out that long. But we're getting there, though. We're doing a lot better right now, so I'll let the team just kind of explain to you some of the things that we've done. Sir, um, we are being informed by a lot of the other activities that are occurring uh, really globally, right? So I, I just came from USRF, where we do a lot with NATO. We're doing a lot there in support of our allies and partners. We understand that there are many initiatives. If we're going to really truly absorb our partners into into the future fight. We have to figure out the data architecture. We've got to figure out the classification. We've got to figure out how to tag it, cleanse it, so we can seamlessly share. There are some great initiatives happening that we are we are learning from, both in the Pacific and in Europe, that are going to allow us, but we're, we're going to incorporate all of those lessons. We're going to fight with joint, joint partners and allies. That's not going to stop. And so we need to make sure that we're taking that into account. Plus, CJAD C2 is a real thing. Right, and it's, it is, you know, Secretary Austin's number one technology priority. So that, that resonates. We understand it. We are involved and plugged in to the CJADC2 CFT. We are plugged in to the CDAO. So we are being informed because we understand that there is going to have to be a really a common data fabric if we're going to, to really be able to share the data seamless, seamlessly with our joint partners and allies. So bottom line, to answer your question, is yes, we are being informed and we're involved. 
and I'll, I'll be happy to tell you that yes, during Project Convergence Capstone Force, specifically during Phase 1 operations that we did at Camp Pendleton, um, our Air Force, Navy, and Marine partners were heavily integrated into that experiment, um, experimenting with 57 of their own technologies on our network. Um, we were using Link 16. Um, we were integrated in um, J Root Charlie as well. So, and not only from our joint partners, but our multinational partners, and our network did support full integration. So we have made some significant progress. Although we are using cross-domain solutions, we are having to do an information sharing agreement with our, our joint partners to integrate their networks into our Capstone 4 network. So there are some complexity and some challenges, but we continue to work through that. And the good news story is, is that we can share with others what we did to effectively communicate. I hope this isn't a tangent or a naive question, you know, tangent being not exactly what this panel is about, but um, can you talk a little bit more about the, uh, the decision <clears throat> in the cycle? You talked a lot about the network, you talked a lot about the data, the decision of what, how, how you, how we decide what effector is used, you know, so when you do any sensor, any shooter, because um, that could potentially be the longest part of the kill chain is do I use EW, do, we, do I use a F-35, do I use a HIMARS? I think you get it. So, yes. Um, so, the network did enable us to make decisions quicker. So from sensor to the processor to the mission command node where a decision is going to be made, then to an effector. Um, there were also some technologies in our partnership with the Global Information Dominance ex Experiment, um, some technologies that enabled us to see across all echelons that targeting packet as it's being developed, which also decreases the, the amount of time needed to um, determine which effector is the best effector. Um, the you know, target release authority is still, you know, it has to be at that level. Um, so the decision made at that particular command post that is the target release authority is still remains um, a decision point. Um, but the technologies both through the network and also with the, our partnership with Guide enabled us to decrease the amount of time because if, those, if you are, have visibility over the target development um, from the combatant command and you already know that that is a target a possibility, and you already have awareness of what effectors can then effectively target that, um, it decreases that cycle as well. Hey, uh, how are you guys doing? You asked. <laughs> So uh, I'll use CDS as the example for the question, but what would be the panel's recommendation for a company that has capability or a technology or a, what you would call it, right? To get into the next capstone or to get into an environment like that. Um, so if I'm building a CDS or I have a CDS, how do I know it, it even fits the mold for the, kind of the exercises going on in capstone four? And, and the next iteration of Capstone or Project Convergence. Um, you know, where's that post? Or how do I get engaged? I know some of it might be sensitive, uh, but then also speaking to some of the other things. Mark, I, I know you mentioned four, four or five opportunities, and that's what I perked up for, that's why I stood up. But how would I get more information about how to get people involved in that so that we could see, see it and test it out and try it out and, and also know that we're not bringing you something that isn't even close to A grade. Good to see you, Chris. Thanks, thanks for the question. Um, <clears throat> so, industry engagement is here, especially at POC 3T, has been really robust. Um, you know, the Thames. I'm sure many of you come to the Thames. Uh, one of the things that I'm instituting at the Thames with, with, with General Ray is, is a more one-on-one -on -one engagement with industry. I want to hear from industry more than than, than you hear from me. In, in sort of going in the future here, uh, to specifically answer your question. Right, and in the run-up to the Thames, and, and as we exit the Thames, we are going to continue to do RFIs, and we're going to continue to show draft RFPs and have a dialogue about those specific opportunities that I mentioned. Not everything's suited to going to Capstone, though, right? And so I think what, when we're creating sort of the scenarios and creating how we go into project convergence, 
we'll then start that dialogue of what technology we want to see with industry in, in, into the capstone. So, so I, I, I wouldn't, uh, if I were an industry partner, I wouldn't be saying I need to get to capstone. That, that's just one event, one area where we're evaluating technology. I think uh, the best way to get in and, and talk to the PEOs is, is, is literally to you know come in and see me, right? Or come in and see my PMs. That is the, the best way to learn about the opportunities that are that are emerging or that are real within the PEO. Can I ask you a question, Chris? Good. Hey, how are you? So I am not a logistician, but I'm a log adjacent, right? Living in a logistician town, contest the logistics, all that good buzzword going around. One of our previous speakers this morning talked about doing logistics repair and maintenance activities in the forge edge of the battlefield. And there's some wise person that said something about amateurs fight tactics, professionals fight logistics. Given that mindset, given the foxhole to the factory demand signal, how are you factoring logistics data, readiness data, and all that stuff into future exercises? Over. Sure. Well, I'll just start it and I'll hand it to the experts. But, but we, we did factor that into the entire project convergence capsule four. We had logistics intel, fires were all part of what we tested out there. So we will continue, and that's why, you know, Joe Rainey stood up the contested logistics uh, CFT, because we knew that was, was a concern right out the gate. Uh, it's something we missed, and we got it back in the box, and now here we are. So, so I think it's gonna continue to be something that we're gonna focus on. Uh, but I'll let the experts kind of talk to talk to you about some of the things we did out there. So there was a whole use case specifically to contested logistics. So um, we did, from a network perspective, to a study on specifically the Rule 1, Rule 2, Rule 3 as well. Um, some of the technologies they were using and some of the transport requirements in the future to support those technologies. Um, they did some autonomous robotics um, built into some of the logistics um, scenarios as well. Um, we partnered with our um, Navy and Marine partners at um, Camp Pendleton um, and did a lot of experimentation there as well. So logistics was baked into every single mission thread um, experimentation that we did in phase one and phase two uh, of Capstone 4. So when General Rainey talks about contested, contested logistics, um, that was absolutely part of Capstone 4. Um, baked in from every single phase and mission thread because as you said, uh, it's, it is absolutely fundamental to what we do when we need it. I'll also just add, so every single, you know, the way General Rainey envisions or, or sees our war fighting functions, he really sees them as, as war fighting systems. And he sees C2 as the core war fighting system and then all the other functions are around and surround that. Logistics obviously being one of those. And so as General Ray already mentioned, we have a contested logistics CFT. We're standing up an all domain sensing CFT. So within the structure of Army Futures Command, we're going to ensure through an open and standard architecture that we are able to share that data seamlessly with C2 being the core. Hopefully that helps a little bit, but that's to ensure that we have total unity of command for the way that we're approaching the problem set. Thank you, Thank you guys. A question as you close this out, thoughts on changing data classification, some of the different policy changes. Any thoughts you have uh, after this event that you know, could help us? Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know. I, I don't necessarily know. I've thought so. So clearly, our network is going to uh, need to be a more flexible, sort of adaptable infrastructure. And so, getting sort of uh, multiple classifications sort of goes counter to that narrative, right? So I think what you're seeing from the Army now is a focus on go, going to unclassify, simplifying the uh, encryption, not not trading the encryption, but simplifying the encryption so we can share more robustly. Um, however, I think there's always going to be this challenge of, of uh, how we're classifying our data, how we're marking our data. Uh, one of the things we did at Capstone really robustly is, is a multinational sharing, right? And, 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 and key to that is following our policy and marking our data correctly so that we can use 
automated ways to share data, you know, sometimes it's, it's as simple as those blocking and tackling things that allow us to share data robustly to random And I think the other piece of it is what I've spoken about over the last two and a half years is that if we're going to achieve data centricity, one of those portions was getting to zero trust, obviously. And one of the key things to zero trust is tagging and labeling our data in a manner that we can share it with our partners and two, attribute-based access control is going to be a part of how we you know, get access to the data itself. So I, I'm not going to come off of that and I'm going to continue to you know, continue to, you know, message that to the team and, uh, and we're going to continue to drive down to achieve that goal. And that's that's what I'm asking the industry to get on, on board with this with. We have to achieve data centricity with robust transport. We have to achieve data centricity with cloud-enabled assets uh, where we can reach to our data. And then zero trust, obviously, the other backbone of that is how we achieve data centricity. So that those are the imperatives. I won't get off of those. Those are I, the things that I started with, and we'll stay there until we achieve it. I think that was the last. Is that the last one? Okay. So, hey, look. Thanks to my team of experts. Give them a round of applause for a great job they did up here. They were awesome. Hopefully, you guys got exactly what you needed about what we did at Project Convergence Capstone 4, uh, Capstone 4 and on to Capstone 5 after that. So, thanks, everybody. Have a great day. The sooner the better. Thank you. I'm going camping this weekend. I'm going to Montesano. I've still got some bugs I'm working out. So, so I, I just go to Monte Santa, so I don't go far, but I can go there and I can spend the next three, four days just, you know, getting everything the way I like it. Yeah, well, plus I live right downtown, so I'm five minutes from the mountain to my home. My wife just had total knee replacement, 
so she doesn't get out much. 